would you say that there is no sin that is unforgivable in this context? No. No. And I got a couple passages to develop in Matthew to help answer that. The first is Matthew 7. And in Matthew 7, it reads, it says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So the really nice thing about this verse is that Robin always has the log in her eye, and I have just a little teeny speck in my eye. Right? So how about mom and dad uh, when one spouse cheated or left the other spouse for uh, another man or woman? Well, yes, it, it is grounds for divorce. But, you know, as we're looking at even when it comes to divorce, we have to come to the matter of forgiving them even though we don't want to remain married to them. And that comes from Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. Peter comes to the Lord and he says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Okay, and then in verse 23, Jesus says, therefore, so he's going to give an illustration of what he's trying to tell people, Peter, that the forgiveness needs to be unconditional and frequent. Verse 23, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him that owed him 10,000 talents. And that is an incalculable amount. You cannot begin to imagine how much money that is. In the Old Testament, you could hire a king and his entire army like for a thousand talents. So this is just a crazy amount of money. The man who owed 10,000 talents, since he could not pay, the master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Now, every country basically today is not flush with cash. They need all kinds of money for their social programs, infrastructure, etc. And for this king to forgive this man, this debt cost him a lot. This was a very painful thing to do financially. So there's a lesson for us as well. When we forgive, there is a cost we must pay. Primarily, the cost is revenge, vengeance, payback, etc. Okay, so he forgave him all the debt. But when that same servant, who was forgiven of the debt, went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, about a hundred days wage. And seizing him, began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. His fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Basically the same thing that the first guy told the king. He refused and went and put him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were bystanders. I don't know if they had people videotaping everything like they have now, but people were aware of what were going on and they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to the king all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servants if I, as I had mercy on you? And the anger of the master, he delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Then Jesus says, primarily to Peter, so also will my heavenly father do to you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. So how this ties in together with Matthew chapter 7, the reason why Robin always has the log in her eye and the reason I only have the little speck in my eye is because God has forgiven Robin so much that my little minor indiscretion is nothing in comparison to all that Robin has been forgiven. So while we say it in jest, the truth still remains. My sin against God is far more hideous, far more painful, far more numerous, and any other adjective we want to stick in there than what a fellow sinner does against me. That is why I always have the speck in my eye. That's why I always thank you. That's why I always have the log in my eye and the speck in someone else's, which then that helps prepare, preserve the marriage. Because if we're always pointing fingers at someone, it's not going to last very long.
But if in kindness and grace we say, God has forgiven me so much, I can forgive this other person that will save the marriage. Now that's not to tolerate sin or to allow sin, and that's not saying there shouldn't be consequences, but the attitude of forgiveness is what preserves the marriage. Mm -hmm. So I think that you are already answering the question number seven. Uh -oh. uh, most young people would aspire for a marriage like yours, yet most end up in divorce in less than 20 years of marriage. So the key ingredient is, or the key to a successful marriage is forgiveness. And that's one of the key ingredients. Mm -hmm. To help prevent the sin is communication. Uh, there must be clear, brutally clear communication. And for the wives, sometimes they have to say it repeatedly, loudly, because us guys were kind of slow to hear. So, but you have to very clearly, and then also then you, you have to be open and transparent, even with the disappointments, the fears, the frustrations. You also, in order to keep the marriage going and enjoy the 43 years we will have this May, is that you gotta have the same goals, uh, the same expectations, the same things out of life. Yeah, I, would, I was going to say communication too. Um, saying it a different way. If your husband, if you say something to your spouse and they don't seem to hear you, say the same thing a different way. Jesus uh, used a lot of parables, so maybe a word picture. Also, too, in talking about forgiveness, another my, one of my favorite examples is Joseph in Genesis chapter fifty. Joseph's brother, when that br brother saw he was dead in verse fifteen, they said it might be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died to say, Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. The brothers knew they did evil. They admitted they did evil. And so they came up with this. It sounds like a scheme to me, but to say, dad said this. Now, please forg uh, forgive him. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But he said to them in verse 18 and verse 19, do not fear, am I in the place of God? It goes on to the most famous verse that you meant for evil, God meant for good. But I like it. it, I like the part, they were evil, they were wrong, but am I in the place of God? I think with forgiveness, we have to be honest, you hurt me and this is how I feel and this is why I'm upset. This is what you can do to make it right. But we have to forgive because God will judge them. We don't need to judge them. Just put it over to God. Let God judge them. Let them know. Doesn't mean that they have to, you know, um, continually mm -hmm. sin against you. You can tell them you could be you could be right. You could be wrong. You talk about it. But let give it up to God. And if there's some, if we come to an impasse on something that does hurt my feelings, because my feelings get hurt, I think maybe because of my personality more then I don't think I hurt Dan's feelings as much, not just because of his personality, but if my feelings get hurt, then I think of all his good characteristics. I don't go down that rabbit hole of take one thing he did and make it 10 times worse. I figure I'll tell him if he accepts it, we move on. If not, I give it to God. And then I remember all the good qualities and don't dwell on the one negative thing. That is one thing I think that people here in America do, I'm not sure in other places, but they dwell um, their differences rather than things they have in common. They dwell on the hurt rather than focusing on all the joy that each other brings each other.